uh, I'm going to go ahead and get started. So with that, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Scott Zaret. I'm the president of CPAacademy.org. You are here today for the IRS Amnesty Program. And again, this class is 1.5 hours. It does qualify for 1.5 credits. And as long as you can hear us okay and you can see the first slide of the PowerPoint presentation, you're in good shape. We have five polling questions that are queued up and ready to go. As a matter of fact, I want to go ahead and launch the first one right now. Sometimes we do this um, when we anticipate uh, new audiences. Um, we we want to make sure that everyone's comfortable with the CPE process. And this is just simply a polling question that uh, you'll see another four of. And uh, we'll try to get our vote rates up here to about 95%. Um, no real surprises here, but Richard, I'll just tell you that uh, 44% um, are saying that their knowledge of IRS offshore voluntary disclosure programs is at the lowest. Uh, about half say 2% uh, say they're in the middle, and about 10% um, say that they are uh, you know experienced in this particular area. So that brings us up to a little lower percentage than I would have liked to have seen, but we'll get that percentage up as we work our way through here. And uh, the other couple comments that I wanted to make. We're regarding the PowerPoint deck. It was made available in advance to you. If you also check the chat bar, you'll see a link to it. You can download that. And there's a ton of content in here. I'd recommend that you, uh, if you don't print it out now, that you at least save that link and have it on file, use it to take notes. We are also recording today's session. And as always, we're going to load it up to our site. And there are um, uh, actually multiple sessions that Richard has done on our platform in the past that are also available. And so uh, there are plenty of, there's plenty of resources uh, uh, that we, uh, we can make available to you. So that's really um, all I wanted to say, other than, um, we're, Richard, we're very pleased to have you here. Um, Richard's background is just uh, extremely extensive. He uh, does have a law degree from Georgetown and a master's in tax law from New York University. He worked for the US Tax Court, and he was a senior tax attorney for the IRS's internal law firm, among uh, other, uh, other endeavors. And so Richard, with that, thank you so much for being here. Thank you. <clears throat> Well, good good afternoon, everybody. I um, I hope I can um, really um, open your eyes up uh, if they haven't been to this topic because it's um, it's it's a it's a wonderful topic for the accounting field. I can tell you that there is an awful lot of business um, that that uh, um, accountants ha have right here, and and this these particular offshore programs. The first thing I want to do is just go through a brief outline of what we're going to talk about, uh, and then we'll we'll go through the outline separately and and uh, in more depth on everything. Um, and reading right from from the panel that you have here, um, there's two separate compliance programs that the IRS has developed in order to really bring the American taxpayer um, online uh, insofar as the international world is concerned. Uh, for the longest time, the United States um, really was not paying big attention to offshore, offshore taxes, offshore bank accounts. Uh, and uh, all of a sudden, uh, uh, things opened up, up in that area. They saw what was going on. Uh, a lot of a lot of um, non-compliance that was going on, and decided to approach the solution here with a bunch of laws, new laws, but also also a program that permits them to to um, uh, taxpayers to get get clean, so to speak, in several different ways. So. Uh, to start off with, there's two separate programs we're going to look at. We're going to look at the Offshore Voluntary Compliance Program, which is the, an expensive program and guarantees closure uh, to taxpayers. And we're going to look at the new Streamline Program that has really uh, only been around for uh, a few months that is a lot less expensive, um, not the same kind of, of closure that one gets in the offshore voluntary compliance program, but but uh, it is truly a streamlined situation where things go fast and and um, uh, we'll we'll talk about that. Now, uh, how did these these administrative programs start? The real start was in <clears throat> 2009, when there had been tremendous amount of um, 
of uh, tax shelter sales in the United States during those years, the, and, and it was by Swiss banks. Uh, they were they were really um, kind of most of them were over the top tax shelters. They didn't work legally. They weren't good deals, uh, and and the United States wound up uh, arresting several people from the United Bank of Switzerland when they were in the United States. Those arrests kind of led to um, uh, the U.S. starting to really get into um, what was going on in offshore banking. And they wait, the U.S. woke up, and the first sign of the wake up was uh, to put in place uh, several laws that are requiring reporting of all these assets. But we're going to focus only on the what the U.S. put in place to um, have Americans give them the opportunity to U.S. taxpayers to become compliant if they weren't compliant with their offshore uh, offshore assets, income, and, and bank accounts. Uh, that offshore voluntary compliance program, we'll, we'll look at the, the details next on the outline, but that started in 2009. It's still continuing in 2014. And in 2014, uh, we, the IRS introduced a new program called the Streamline Program. The Streamline Program, uh, we'll, we'll um, uh, go over that, and that, that's the one that has greatly reduced penalties, greatly reduced um, reporting requirements, uh, but also has its own, its own uh, obligations that people have to be careful with. Now, in the offshore voluntary compliance program, we're going to look at what what is necessary to comply. We're going to look at the eight years of amended tax returns that has to be filed, the taxes that have to pay, be paid. Then there's a 20% accuracy penalty on those taxes, and there's interest on the on those taxes. Now. In a lot of a lot of cases, the, as a practical matter, there isn't that much income tax that that's typically owed. Uh, so many of these cases with the offshore uh, banks, uh, the people had their money in the banks and they really weren't making any money on it. Um, but but um, the income tax is is not the real um, the real problem for a lot of people um, from a financial standpoint uh, of joining the offshore voluntary disclosure program. The, the, there's always, for, for quite a while, we've got the FBAR penalty that's, that has been on the books that permits the Internal Revenue Service to actually take 50% of one's highest bank deposit balance uh, if there's if there's um, a willful failure to to uh, comply with the with the laws here, that FBAR penalty is used as a club in in the compliance program. Basically, the IRS wants its taxes, and then they want to make sure um, that they're they're getting what uh, maybe they never got in the past. The club they have is that if you're a willful, willful filer or non-filer of, of your of bank reports, they can charge 50, a 50% 50 penalty. So the IRS has modified that and, and made as a price of this offshore voluntary disclosure program a penalty of 27.5% on your highest bank balance over the uh, the period of years that, that are being looked at. Um, now, we're going to see as we, as we uh, after we get through with looking at the voluntary compliance program, we're going to see that there's several places in the voluntary compliance program that, that um, People can get reduced penalties for for many different reasons, and we'll look at we'll look at several of them. 
uh, we'll stop and then have uh, questions and answers on the offshore voluntary compliance program, the, the, the program that's got the highest um, reporting and the highest amounts of money that are being turned over. Um, we'll go on after that, and we're going to look at the Streamline program, which is, is um, its history is very recent. I have a feeling that it's a result of the IRS throwing such a wide net out uh, with the Offshore Voluntary Compliance Program and catching in that wide net a lot of innocent people that, that didn't belong in a net that was that expensive. The IRS very recently came out with their Streamline Program. This allows U.S. tax residents who can prove that their failure to file their, their um, re information returns on foreign assets, particularly the foreign bank, bank deposits, people who can prove that they really did not have a certain bad intent that we'll look at closer uh, are going to be able to, to go ahead and, and join the Streamline program which requires only three years of prior taxes. Um, and, and for Americans who are resident in the United States, greatly reduced bank deposit and foreign asset penalties, 10 to 5%. And for American taxpayers who are not resident in the US, uh, they don't even require the payment of any kind of bank deposit penalty. Um, we'll, we'll then spend <clears throat> A, a, a little bit of time focusing on the concept of willfulness because and so far as the practitioner is concerned everyone who walks in the door with an with an offshore problem let's say uh, you're going to depending upon the concept of will willfulness you're going to be guiding them into one of these different programs um, and so we need to we need to know just what that looks like. Uh, we also are going to have some time to look at some special exceptions that um, have allowed people to get reduced penalties. Um, examples of this is uh, there's a special exception for Holocaust victims, uh, and there's uh, and there's several of these special exceptions, and another one where. If you haven't filed, but but uh, you don't owe any taxes, um, uh, uh, that that's another way of reducing the the uh, foreign bank penalty. So maybe we can move on to the next five. The so let's now take a a, a look at the um, the details of the offshore voluntary com compliance program. This is started in 2009. The, the original amnesty program, which I substitute the words offshore voluntary compliance and amnesty kind of interchangeable uh, uh, in, in this presentation, that it, the IRS started off in 2009 with their first program uh, that has developed there was there have been later programs the later programs all had uh, fixed end dates uh, that forced people to kind of at least the first group uh, I believe 35,000 people complied uh, because of there was an end date on the first program uh, the last program that IRS has come out with uh, is open-ended um, they have not they have not uh, place any date where they're going to not allow people to get into the offshore voluntary compliance program. Um, they are, though, um, paying a lot of attention to foreign assets now. Um, the the uh, IRS has got new agents. They're, the penalties and fines uh, that can result from, from not reporting foreign income can really be be ruin your financial life. Uh, so that's the reason that people are 
taking a good hard look on these amnesty programs. Now the civil penalties, uh, all, all of these penalties that I'm going to mention that could apply to the delinquent taxpayer, all of these penalties, uh, amnesty is granted by virtue of joining the offshore voluntary disclosure program. So, so um, uh, this is this is what you're buying for your 27 and a half percent bank penalty. Um, there's the penalty for not uh, reporting your financial bank accounts. Um, this is the one, as I discussed, that that um, they're using as a club uh, if there's willfulness. There's the penalty for the failure to re to report when you've got large foreign gifts and transactions with foreign trusts. Penalty for failing to report ownership in foreign trusts. Penalty for uh, shareholders and directors uh, in foreign corporations. Um, all of these have their own forms that need to be filed with penalties for them. Uh, there's fraud penalties that can result in civil fines that are very significant. Uh, the fraud penalty for failing to file a tax return, fraud penalty for failing to pay the amount of the tax shown on the return, and then there's the accuracy penalty, which also can add a significant penalty for, to the underpayment of taxes. Um, the IRS's other tool that they have um, when negotiating some of these things is that failure to pay taxes on foreign income can also be, in, involve criminal penalties um, uh, for failing to for filing false return and even failure to file an income tax return, which uh, involves uh, you see it on the screen imprisonment for for several years. So this is that, that's the group of um, penalties that are not going to be asserted because someone uh, is, goes through the, the offshore voluntary disclosure program. Uh, again, we'll just quickly review the, the um, work that needs to be done to comply with the program. Eight years of prior taxes filed by either amended returns or uh, initial returns if, there's, if nothing's been reported. 27% or a 20% penalty <clears throat> on the unpaid tax, taxes and the interest on the amounts due over the eight-year period, and the one-time penalty of 27.5% of the highest aggregate balance at any one point in time in the foreign bank accounts, or, uh, or, and now we add to it the foreign assets. Um, owned by owned by the delinquent taxpayer. Now, the there's uh, certain people who are not going to be able to get into the offshore voluntary disclosure pro program. These are taxpayers who have undisclosed offshore accounts or assets um, uh, that that um, are are under investigation um, uh, if you're if you're even if your undisclosed foreign assets have not yet been discovered in the investigation if you're involved in an investigation the offshore voluntary compliance program is not available to you <clears throat> next um, there's this is um, I have this under eligibility, but what really belongs kind of more on uh, some of the exceptions where where there's no requirement uh, to pay the penalty. And if you've got taxpayers who have had foreign assets who reported and paid tax on all of their taxable income for those years, and they simply didn't file their information returns reporting that they had these foreign assets, foreign bank accounts, or other, now there's a newer form for other foreign assets, um, they, this huge bank penalty is not going to apply. Next slide. The, the next item is that um, 
uh, once you once everything is put together uh, and all of the amended tax returns are done, all of the penalties are calculated, uh, the IRS expects a check with all of those final documents. Um, however, uh, the IRS is still open open to um, negotiation on payment plans and what have you, the, the same as any other tax liability. Um, for the practitioner, what needs to be filed is the copies uh, of the previously filed original returns uh, and then complete uh, accurate amended federal returns and the foreign account bank account report or the new foreign uh, asset statement report. And along with that is um, the, the, uh, the check payable. There's a penalty calculation form that, that uh, is on the Internal Revenue Service website. And uh, for accounts in excess of $500,000, uh, all of these tax returns need to be um, accompanied by uh, financial statements that are reflecting the account activities. Uh, also, uh, there's a, a need to um, sign the form agreeing to uh, uh, consent to extend the period on the statute of limitations for this investigation, the ongoing investigation. The the um, Offshore penalty framework, uh, at, at, for, at the time of the initial um, amnesty program in 2009, this actually uh, was only applicable to foreign bank accounts. But now, as a result of other FATCA laws uh, and reporting requirements of all foreign assets, the amnesty penalty framework uh, is, extends to, to um, uh, more than just the foreign bank accounts. Uh, the penalty applies to all assets directly owned by the taxpayer, which includes financial accounts, securities, custodial assets, tangible assets. Um, and and, uh, and uh, there's also a, um, uh, an alter ego or nominee look through where uh, uh, any of these assets what really are owned by the taxpayer just indirectly through corporations, what have you, um, the, these are also going to be subject to the, to the penalty if you're part of the offshore voluntary disclosure program. The 27.5% penalty is calculated as 27.5% of the highest aggregate value during the eight-year period covered by the voluntary disclosure. If the taxpayer has multiple accounts or assets, these, these are aggregated for, the, for determining the highest value. Next slide, please. Now, we're going to take a look at um, some of these, some of these um, uh, ways that the penalties have been reduced. We already uh, described uh, one of them, which, which is that um, if there's no taxes due, and it's simply a matter of not filing the, um, the, the proper information returns. The, there's also, uh, and these penalties are, I mean, these exclusions uh, have some very tight law lines drawn, um, but they are there, and there are going to be people who fit into them. Uh, taxpayers who meet all four of the following conditions will pay only a 5% offshore penalty. Uh, one, that they didn't open the account or cause the account to be opened. Uh, so it's basically it's an, an inherited account. Um, uh, that, that, that that they're not the instigators of. Number two, that there really is not a lot of contact and and um, trading and uh, um, 
uh, ins and outs, what have you, of funds uh, and in, in the accounts. Third, that there's been only minimal withdrawals from the account. And number four, that the account that was originally opened, which is going to be only was going to be the subject of the five percent penalty, uh, that that the taxes on that account uh, were paid, uh, and that is not an account that that is made up of of, um, of monies upon which taxes were never collected. Now, there is also um, another approach to to the um, offshore voluntary disclosure program that that um, allows taxpayers that that fit into these categories uh, to reduce their bank penalties and next slide the the, uh, the actually I'm going to talk out of turn on on these slides instead of uh, I'm going to address not question 17. I'm going to address something there's not a slide about, and then talk about question 17. But what what uh, has happened in the offshore voluntary disclosure program is that the net that was thrown was so wide, and getting uh, so many people in there that really, really were not. Um, malevolent in their failure to files and shouldn't be in that huge um, penalty, that bank penalty. And, and so the service has allowed taxpayers who um, are in the offshore voluntary disclosure program to do what they call as an opt-out. Um, and, and typically you don't know whether you're your taxpayer, your client, is going to opt out or or not until you've gone ahead and done all of their tax returns and seen everything there there is to see. Because after after you see the complete picture, you may find that there are um, uh, people who were not willful when they were not filing their not filing their tax returns. Um, everybody's got a story of one sort or another of of why of why they uh, haven't filed filed their returns or or reported everything completely, and and if you really don't need if the client doesn't need the protection of that there'll be no criminal issues that there'll be no none of all these issues that you're protected from, and you have a story of of non-willfulness. Um, the the service does allow you to opt out of the program and just go go through an examination and and argue what the law is uh, and that you're entitled to less of a less of a uh, penalty. Um, now, also another uh, uh, item that's not not in the um, in, in the slides here, I do want to mention a very, very great resource for everybody, and that is the Internal Revenue Service itself. Um, if you need to go on irs.gov and just put in the words offshore voluntary compliance program, and you will see a significant amount of guidance. Uh, on how this program is working. Um, and the reason for that, one has to keep in mind, this is an administrative program. This is not um, any law, really, that Congress has passed. And so along with the this administrative program, IRS has tried to get out um, materials that are something like regulations, let's say. And they're in the form of frequently asked questions and answers. Uh, and you'll find a lot of up-to-date materials that are updated pretty frequently uh, on that IRS website. So I just want to make, make sure I would mention that. Um, but the other ways 
to reduce penalties are um, in that frequently asked uh, questions and answers. Um, and it addresses, uh, it'll address a lot of your questions. But they do say that if the, if the taxpayer um, would have paid lesser penalties um, based on their fact pattern, then they will pay under the voluntary compliance program, including the penalty. Uh, if you can come in and prove that you're entitled to the to lesser penalties for your failures to file, um, the IRS will will not assert the the highest penalty. They will assert the lesser penalty that you can prove by law you're entitled to. So next page, Mandy. Hey, Richard. Actually, would it, would it be okay to stop and do a poll? Uh, um, I think there's only one more, one or two more um, slides on this. Okay, uh, that I'd works like for me. To, I'd like to finish it up. Let yep. me just let me just see here. Um, yeah. It's really no problem. Yeah, yeah let me. Um, yeah, uh, we we will be finished up. Let me just yeah. There's only there's only two more slides here. Um, uh, the, the the next slide is is um, discusses um, the uh, another one of the frequently asked uh, questions and answers, and the uh, and uh, we can we can just go we'll just go through this. Uh, this is points out that. The um, examiners really can't negotiate uh, a, a, a lower penalty with you um, uh, as part of the settlement. The 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 uh, it's it's either the 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 bank deposit twenty seven and a half percent penalty or opt out and take your chances elsewhere. Um, but but. Uh, um, but at the same time, they will they will honor the fact that if you are in tie, if you fit into a different penalty category um, that they, they that is lower than this, that uh, they they will honor that. So let's move on. The next slide. Hello, Mindy. Next slide. Oh, she's saying she can't click it for some reason. Um, there we go. Uh, okay, there we go. Yep. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, this is just this next slide is just a wrap up of what we were talking about. That you've got legal safeguards in this in this compliance program. You got high costs, but you also have a range of penalties. Uh, and uh, also keep in mind that this is an open ended program. Uh, and the IRS can terminate it whenever they decide to. Um, and uh, for people who really um, have real a real issues of um, uh, you know willful willful failure to file and things like that, uh, this program is something that definitely needs to be uh, taken into consideration. So we can now open this up for uh, questions. Well, let's do a couple of polls here. We have we had some people asking about it. We want to stay on track with that first. And um, the question is, what is the percentage of the highest foreign asset value that must be paid as a penalty in the offshore voluntary compliance program? And you have three options here. And we're doing well with polls. And we're doing well with questions, too. We have a lot of questions. And, and Richard, it might be, would it be all right with you if we were to compile some of them and uh, perhaps revisit them at the end. Make sure. Uh, in any way, any way you want to handle it. I mean, we can go right into the streamline program, or we can answer the uh, question these questions on the voluntary compliance program. Let's. Uh, well, let me first ask you for the, for this particular poll. What was the correct answer? Was it twenty seven point five percent? Yes. All right, because that's what eighty five percent responded with. So I'm glad to see that. Uh, we're testing well here. And then I'm going to go ahead 
and do another poll, and we'll just catch up. And, and the requirements for NASA are that we ask three within a credit hour, meaning 50 minutes. And uh, we do issue partial credits, meaning 1 or 1 1.5 for the specific class. But uh, this class will go beyond 75 minutes, and we, uh, I think, would be in good shape, or it would be wise to, to stay on and, and um, stick around for the Q&A, because I think that's going to be very valuable as well. And so the question is, can a taxpayer enter the voluntary compliance program and then choose to opt out? And most of us are saying yes to this one. Is that what you were going for there? Yes, yes. All right. Someone had asked, they said, I thought uh, FAQ 16 to 18 were no longer applicable. Is that? Well, the principles that you you've got to you've got to change in the in 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 the um, uh, you've got to updated you know updated questions and answers, but you find those principles are are still running throughout there. All right, so I just closed that one down too, and we're back to the next section. And if it's if it's okay with you, I think we'll try to consolidate and make sure we have enough time to get into a, a, a good uh, Q and A session at the end. And, and what's our timing right now? Oh, we're at thirty six minutes, with meaning we have an hour left, a, rough, a little less than an hour left. Uh, oh yeah, that's not going to be an issue. Great. Okay, so uh, are we going to get into any of the the Questions or go right into the streamline. Uh, I prefer streamline if that's if that's acceptable. Sure. Okay. So um, again, uh, back up for a little bit of history. Um, you've got this this offshore voluntary compliance program out there. Um, you have a significant response. Um, along with that, um, as the years went on the United States put in place all of its laws that are requiring this strict uh, reporting from banks all over the world, intermediaries, what have you. Uh, and what was in place uh, until 2014 was only the offshore voluntary disclosure program <clears throat> with uh, high penalties for across the board um, with the opt-out program that I imagine um, was taking up an awful lot of the Internal Revenue Service's time uh, because, like I said, the, the, the net that was thrown uh, was thrown over the in innocent babies and, and people hire, hiding multi-millions all at, all at the same time. And so I'm sure that uh, the, the the one the one size fits all was starting to um, administratively be a real headache to the Internal Revenue Service, and and so what they did in in comply at, at the same time that all the other FATCA um, laws kicked into place that have required foreign bank accounts to report on on their American accounts and what have you. They came out with this Streamline program, which is, is a program that uh, it looks to, to, to just be intended to make sure that they get as many people uh, who are U.S. taxpayers on the radar screen. Um, because the Streamline program is, is made things very easy for for, for people, um, relatively inexpensive for people, uh, and and um, uh, the end result is that whoever goes into the streamline program uh, is now going to be uh, a taxpayer that the United States knows about, and and so I think this program was designed to get uh, as many people on the radar screen as possible. And at the same time, to to uh, bring a little better justice to the system, uh, so that you could ferret out um, um, people who really, uh, uh, when they paid their 27 and a half percent penalty, uh, maybe even owed a lot more from the taxes they never paid. 
versus the people who would have a 27 and a half percent penalty uh, when all they had to pay was peanuts. And so, so this streamline program is uh, it's a very good program to accomplish some of those things. Uh, it has, though, uh, what I think is is one major drawback. The major drawback is we're going to leave until the end of the program for this discussion of the word willfulness. Um, the, whether, whether a taxpayer is willful or non-willful when they don't file certain information returns uh, is the taxpayer's state of mind and it's, and it's all the surrounding facts and what have you. Um, they have left to the practitioner um, uh, to now have to guide people into the offshore compliance program or the streamline program. And it's the practitioner who has to really be making the determination of whether the taxpayer's conduct is willful or non-willful, which is not, it's not a question, um, I mean, it's certainly it's a question of law, but it's, it, it goes so much deeper um, because it's a question of state of mind uh, that they've made it, um, they've, they've, they've made it um, not easy for the practitioner to really give um, uh, excellent guidance on this sometimes because there's a, there's a lot of people who, who um, uh, show some signs of willfulness, not a lot of signs. <laughs> I mean, it's so it's it, it's a good program, but I'm not quite sure if it's um, going to be e easy for the practitioners who are trying to administer the program. But anyway, um, let's well, let's look at what the program is. The streamlined procedures are designed to provide to the taxpayers. In 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 two situ two situations two things um, they can file amended or delinquent returns and they can resolve their tax and penalty obligations. This is all regarding offshore income only. Um, the the IRS has has really announced this. Uh, as a, what I consider to be a beneficial settlement tool um, to to um, have taxpayers get on board quickly. The eligibility requirements for the streamline procedures are very much like the eligibility requirements for the offshore voluntary disclosure program, um, except the, the streamlined procedures are designed for individual taxpayers and estates of individual taxpayers as opposed to uh, all the different corporate entities that the voluntary disclosure program can apply to. The streamlined procedures apply to U.S. individuals who are residing outside the United States and those residing inside the United States. And they have made a distinction here um, in the penalty payments between those residing inside and outside the United States. Um, the, 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 the big item in, in, in here is, as I talked about, um, that the taxpayer needs to certify um, uh, that their failure to report all income, pay all tax, and submit all required information returns was due to non-willful conduct. So the, the penalties less, the amount of work and tax returns you'll see that have to be submitted are less, but you've got, you've got people signing under penalties of perjury uh, that they have not willful in any of these filings. Um, the uh, uh, again, like the uh, voluntary compliance program, taxpayers who are under civil examination are not going to be eligible for the streamlined program. Uh, but uh, they do say the IRS does post and say that 
um, you should consult with the agent um, uh, and and see whether there's any possibility um, for a taxpayer under uh, examination to, to make use of this. Uh, and certainly people who are subject to criminal examination uh, are not going to be uh, able to get into the streamline program. And what they have done, uh, which is kind of unique, when the offshore voluntary disclosure program was the only program around, several taxpayers chose to not get into the offshore voluntary disclosure program because of its of its large bank deposit penalty, but instead take their chances, go ahead, file their tax returns, file amended returns, file whatever the forms are, and report that they had foreign financial uh, accounts, and take their chances that uh, this wouldn't be picked up in an audit and the service wouldn't come back and say, by the way, we want a 50% bank deposit penalty from you instead of a 27.5% bank deposit penalty. So a lot of people made quiet disclosures, and then the IRS started turning up the heat on these quiet disclosures. And um, in these new streamlined procedures, uh, what they've done is to say, if you've made a quiet disclosure, uh, now that we're coming out with these streamlined procedures, which will be so less costly to you, uh, you can enter into the streamlined pr procedure even though you've made a quiet disclosure. So uh, again, it's, uh, you know, get everybody that um, is a U.S. taxpayer and find out who they are and get them on the radar screen. Um, so <clears throat> they, we, can, we can move on from this, this slide. Okay. Now, there's, we're going to talk about the eligibility procedures for the Streamline program, really more to distinguish uh, the two programs between the people who are U.S. taxpayers who are here in the U.S. and the people who are U.S. taxpayers but are not resident in the U.S. So for the, the, the first group, people who are in the U.S., uh, you have to be a U.S. tax resident and a U.S. taxpayer. And you, you have to have previously filed your most recent three years U.S. tax returns. So this program doesn't extend to, to non-filers. It doesn't extend to delinquent returns. It really uh, is, it stops, and, and which it differs for the U.S. taxpayers who are non-residents. We'll see that. But U.S. taxpayers who are residents, um, uh, the program is not available for them if they are non-filers. Delinquent returns have to, have to just go ahead and, and do what delinquent returns have always done without the benefit of this. Uh, but if you've got a return and, it, and you're going to amend it strictly for the foreign income, uh, then, then the program is available. Um, and the, the key item uh, of, of all of this is, is that um, uh, they didn't file their, their um, various information returns reporting the foreign assets. And again, the last item of eligibility, that this was a result of non-willful conduct. Um, and the, the definition of non-willful conduct, uh, and there's just several definitions, they all say pretty much the same, but the test for willfulness is whether there was a voluntary, intentional violation of a known legal duty. A finding of willfulness must be supported by evidence of willfulness, the burden of establishing willfulness, it's on the U.S. Uh, and if you have reasonable cause and several other, other defenses, the willfulness penalty uh, is not asserted. So 
the uh, this is just kind of um, uh, just a reminder that we, you really need to get good professional advice on this because there are so you've got these choices of programs uh, and it's a big difference uh, and choices of not getting into any program also so this stuff is um, you need professionals who are working in this area because um, there's a lot of close calls here now I'm going to talk a, uh, a bit about the certification statement that has to be filed um, with the prior year's tax returns uh, and the other documents that need to be filed as part of the Streamline pro program. Um, first of all, any FBARs uh, have to have been filed already, has to have been sent in ahead of time and then also included in the filing for the Streamline. Um, and uh, second is is um, this uh, non-willful um, in the certification. Uh, the taxpayer, and much more than the offshore voluntary compliance program, the streamlined program makes it crystal clear that they want their money right away. Um, and the offshore voluntary compliance program often you can send in your your delinquent taxes, your accuracy penalty. Um, you know, wait wait for them to come back to collect the bank penalty. But uh, on on this one, on the voluntary on the streamline program, they're basically saying that if they don't have a check, uh, they're 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 not going to treat it. And so um, uh, that that's an important part of this. Um, uh, and along with along with the amended returns, the proper information returns, you also need to put on the certification statement the last six years for the FBARs, and that's and the penalty now um, for the the streamline program is basically. Um, the offshore penalty, you've got your three years of tax returns that you need to do. Uh, uh, but the penalty is only a 5% penalty on what otherwise could be a 50% penalty under the strictest of the FPAR rules. Um, and and uh, basically, uh, they make it clear that um, there, there was not going to be any accuracy-related penalty uh, attached to the uh, the three years on the tax returns. <coughs> um, now, of, of again, for the practitioner, um, there's some some very strict requirements. Where again, that what they're saying is, if you don't um, say "May I?" really uh, on these returns and do them exactly right that they're not going to um, treat them as streamlined returns. So that the returns and the, the information and, and the tax returns that, that you're filing as part of the streamlined program must include at the top of the first page of these delinquent returns, the, in red, the words streamlined foreign, foreign offshore. Um, and or else it's going to get off in a different direction instead of the direction that you want it to be. Um, uh, this is really um, uh, a repeat of what I just what I previously went through on what needs to be committed, uh, uh, what needs to be completed in the certification um, uh, that's filed, and you'll find. On the Internal Revenue Service um, website, you'll find all the documents, uh, the certification documents. You'll find everything there to comply with the streamline procedure. Um, now, we, we're, we're going to switch over to um, look at those United States taxpayers who 
don't live in the United States. And the standard is if don't spend 330 days a, a, a year um, or that do spend 330 days a year outside of the United States. But for, for these taxpayers, um, they've made it uh, even easier. Uh, if you are a, a um, U.S. taxpayer and you have been living outside of the United States, um, you can get on the radar screen and you can have your past cleared up with the filing of just your three years prior U.S. tax return. Uh, either if, if you have not filed U.S. returns, at all, file your three prior years U.S. tax returns and pay no bank deposit penalty. Or if you have filed U.S. returns and not included your foreign income, uh, then file amended returns with your foreign income. In, in either case, uh, all that all that's going to happen to that taxpayer residing outside of the United States is that they're going to have the taxes to pay on that on that three year filing, but they're not going to have to pay uh, any kind of bank penalty. Um, and the big difference here is that in the um, American U.S. taxpayers who are onshore here or residents of the U.S., they can't get into the Streamline program if they have delinquent returns. They can only get in the Streamline program if they filed the returns but didn't include their foreign income. For the U.S. taxpayers residing outside of the United States, uh, they can file, uh, they can uh, enter into the Streamline program by filing either amended returns, if they've eliminated or omitted their foreign income, or by filing um, delinquent returns. Uh, those will be accepted from offshore, offshore individuals. Um, now we'll, we'll um, the last topic we're going to look at is to study this concept of willfulness as, as best as one can. And um, before looking at the slides, um, I want to make a comment of, about, um, I, this, I'll call it the state of the law right now, but I'm not sure um, if I would better call it the, the confused state of the law. Um, what has happened recently is I mean, the IRS and the Justice Department, um, they choose good cases that they can win. Um, and that's how, that's how principles are set. Um, and, and so the IRS found several very good cases of individuals who were obviously willful, wrongful, people in their filing with the United States and paying their taxes and filing their information returns and looking for ways to get out of it and everything else. And, and the IRS uh, brought cases um, against those, those cases that are, if you wanted the ideal description of willfulness, they brought cases against those people. And in those cases that the IRS won, and most of a couple of them you know, fairly recently, they seem to have almost changed the definition of willfulness uh, and, and made it, um, uh, let's say, easier for somebody to try and find you as willful. Um, and, and that's only because of a lot of um, court statements and, and, and uh, um, uh, dicta in cases that involved th these um, people who were obviously wrongdoers. Uh, and the, the court seemed to have let it spill over <clears throat> and muddied up the waters 
about what is really meant by by a willful taxpayer. Um, uh, and even the Internal Revenue Service own documents uh, seem to be a little more liberal uh, on trying to define a willful a willful taxpayer from a non-willful taxpayer than the cases do. Uh, but some of the some of the um, information from the IRS manual, for in, for instance, um, I'm just going to uh, quote right from the chart. Uh, the innocent failure of an unsophisticated taxpayer to know the filing requirements for international transactions coupled with other factors, such as the lack of any efforts taken to conceal the existence of the accounts, could not lead to a conclusion that the violation was due to willful blindness. Or the mere fact that a person checked the wrong box or no box on the schedule indicating for an account to establish the FBAR violation was attributable to willful blindness. So, so you can see um, from the older IRS manuals, um, uh, I, I think a, a more accurate definition of willfulness. Um, it, this goes on to say, willfulness can rarely be proved by direct evidence since it is a state of mind. It's usually established by drawing a reasonable inference from all the available facts. The government may base a determination of willfulness and the failure to file the FBAR on inferences from conduct meant to conceal sources of income or other financial information. For FBAR purposes, this could include concealing signature authority, interest in various transactions, and interest in entities transferring cash to foreign banks. Now, I can tell you <clears throat> from from practice, from the from from the daily um, what what goes on. Um, you you have a, a mixed bag of 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 um, uh, people who uh, who have not fa filed. Um, many of them uh, truly clueless. Uh, many of them. Um, so focused on their businesses, uh, on so many other things, that um, truly clue clueless. But uh, I'm not quite sure if cl clueless um, is is enough to make the grade um, when you are um, really trying to get to the bottom of whether someone is willful or not. Um, but the service w has been. Um, like I say, they've been very good about their publications on this because um, they were asked civil willful, whether civil willfulness and criminal willfulness uh, are kind of one and the same. And they said yes. So they, they have basically said this is a very high standard uh, of, of wrongdoing to file willfulness. Um, now, here's... Here's um, some of the factors that are looked at when you look when you're seeing whether whether there's willfulness or not. One, whether the failure to file timely or the failure to include correct information is part of a pattern of conduct, repeatedly failing to file timely or include correct information. Whether the correction was promptly made on discovery of the failure. Whether the filer corrects a failure or a fi failure to include correct information within 30 days after the date of a written request from the Internal Revenue Service to file or correct. Now, that one, uh, that goes a bit far. But anyway, whether the amount of the information reporting penalties is less than the cost of complying with the requirement to file timely or to include correct information on an information return. In other words, if it's just nuisance value, um, they're, they're not going to bother with it. Now, uh, another way to come at this um, understanding of the definition of willfulness uh, is I've got some quotes fr um, from some of the courts that have ruled on this. And they, these quotes are interesting. Um, uh, to help flesh out the concept of willfulness. 
Um, first, we have the Supreme Court, where the Supreme Court actually, um, <clears throat> everyone I'm sure has heard that statement that ignorance is not a defense. Uh, ignorance of the law is not a defense. Well, there's a long-held doctrine that in tax law, ignorance can be a defense. Um, and this is the Supreme Court saying that willfulness requires proof of an intentional violation of a known legal duty, meaning there must be some evidence beyond recklessness that a taxpayer was aware of the relevant reporting requirements. A showing that the defendant acted with careless disregard is not adequate. Willfulness is an entirely subjective determination. And next slide. Um, uh, under some statutes, an act is willful only if done with malevolently, wickedly, and criminally. Um, other statutes that use the word willful uh, are a little less than that. It suffices that the act was performed consciously and voluntarily, rather than inadvertently or accidentally. Um, and this is a this is a, a good quote of. Um, that shows how we struggle with this term. Betwixt these two formulations, willful has been given various other meanings, although shades of different, difference oftentimes diminish when the probe extends beneath the surface. Because of its inherent instability, only the most careful consideration of the term willful in its legislative context can provide satisfactory assurance that eventually it will be taken in its proper cast. So you can see the courts are still still struggling with this critical, critical determining factor um, that, that um, has to be decided. And like I said, often um, it's, it's not decided until after the full accounting is over and done with, uh, and you're able to see the tax returns, see what the income looked like, see see what a small or large percentage of that income might be of what what was reported. There's so many factors that one needs to look at in this willfulness determination, um, and it is the key to um, providing some the right advice to the taxpayers in this area. So um, I think that pretty much covers it. And um, we're ready to take questions. Scott? Hello. Hang on, Richard. Scott's uh, okay. getting it together here. Hold on. Okay. How many minutes was it? All right. I'm sorry. We have a poll. We have a polling question up right now. Okay. And uh, yeah, sorry, I had my mic on mute there, but we'll keep this one open just for a moment. And we will, oh, we're at 87%. 90% of you voted, we'll close that one down. And we'll share that with you. And so Richard, not a consensus yes. on this. We have two thirds oh. said no on this one. That's right. Yeah, the no is right. And let me go ahead and do another poll. Uh, it's a streamlined program available for taxpayers who are ready under IRS investigation. And this is a yes or no, and the no's are coming in. And that is the response we were looking for there. All right, we'll get those votes in, and thank you very much. All right, Richard, I'll close that one down and share that. We had more no's by a long right, shot. Right, right, correct. Okay, we're back to your slides now. 
Uh, I think I think we're ready for questions at this point. Okay, hold on one second. All right, Richard. So we have five questions. Uh, I'm going to start out with with some that I've um, that I've gathered here, and then we can move on from there. And I know we're going to have more questions that come in. I'm trying to do my best here to break them down into categories and some some um, uh, basically and into different buckets. So let me go through these in no particular order, and if anything here seems like you'd prefer that I skip it, we can move on. First okay. question is, uh, what kind of assets does the offshore penalty apply to? Uh, it's actually, it applies to um, bank deposits. It applies to tangible assets. It, uh, I think we had it, I think, listed, uh, listed it in detail in one of the slides. Uh, let me just find that. Um, I can give you a complete list of it. Um, uh, uh, let's, any financial account maintained by a foreign financial in institution stock or security issued by any person other than the United States person, financial instruments or contracts held for investment uh, that has an issuer or counterparty that is not a United States person, uh, interest in foreign entities, uh, interest in tangible assets, um, which uh, include um, income producing real estate, um, um, it's 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 a pretty pretty uh, non-exclusive, let's say. Okay. Um, the next question is, if after making a voluntary disclosure, a taxpayer disagrees with the application of the offshore penalty, what can a taxpayer do? Yeah. Well, that's when the taxpayer would opt out of the program. Um, there, uh, as as we talked about, uh, there's no there's no discretion to um, to to reduce the offshore penalty uh, if if you think you are not willful, uh, and then you might be entitled to a lesser penalty under under the uh, the laws uh, uh, governing F bar penalties. There's several other reasons why you might be entitled to a lesser penalty. Um, but you have to either be in the program and pay the penalty if you want to have all of the finality of the program, or opt out of the program, um, taking your chances really on what, uh, what they might find under the law. Uh, and, but you can opt out of the program and then they will just examine you under the law, and you'll make your case uh, for the fact that you uh, should be fit into a, a lower penalty. All right, Richard. The next one is if multiple taxpayers are co-owners of an offshore account, who would be liable for the offshore penalty? Yeah. Well, on, on, on that, um, the, the person who's got the financial interest um, is is going to be responsible for their portion of the penalty. Um, and so, I mean, I've had several cases already where you have to um, come in and be able to prove that maybe there's three people on an account and two of them are not American taxpayers. And uh, the American taxpayer, who is a signatory, uh, maybe owns only 20% of the of that account. So your 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 responsibility for the bank penalty uh, is is the responsibility for the value of your your assets. Next question: How do I request preclearance before I submit any offshore voluntary disclosure? Um, yeah, that's a good question because uh, um, I can see now that's one one item that uh, I left out for everybody that I that I should um, review. Um, uh, the 
there's a procedure. Um, oh, we'll talk about two procedures. There's a procedure to enter the offshore voluntary compliance program, and there's a procedure for the streamlined program. The procedure for the offshore voluntary compliance program uh, is one where the first thing that you do is to write to the Internal Revenue Service. Uh, all of this is in uh, on the IRS website. Uh, you submit the name of the taxpayer who wants to join the offshore voluntary disclosure program. You submit the taxpayer's name. You submit a lot of information about the taxpayer. You now submit uh, the name of the bank, of, uh, if it's a bank deposit, that the taxpayer's deposit is in. Uh, and the Internal Revenue Service then will take that submission. They will check it out against whether the person is under examination or uh, what's happening now, and this is a very late development in this game, but the Internal Revenue Service and the Justice Department have now started to put tremendous pressures on the foreign banks to turn over the names of uh, taxpayer, uh, U.S. U.S. taxpayer accounts, and and um, if if the bank in which a taxpayer has a foreign account uh, has already turned over that taxpayer's name, um, uh, the I'm not sure if the voluntary disclosure is 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 going to be available to them. So there's there's um, quite a push on on um, uh, making making sure that um, uh, everybody's got their ducks in a row uh, before their names are turned over to the IRS. But anyway, the first step is you send in your document, uh, uh, your request for clearance, uh, indicating who the taxpayer is. Um, you used to get clearance back in about two weeks, two to three weeks. Uh, now I think the program is quite overloaded, and it's been up to two months before you get clearance back, um, in my experience. Uh, once you do have clearance um, and, and they are able to say you're entitled to be in the program, uh, the next step is 45 days after that you'll, you will submit a short form type of disclosure. Again, this can be found on the IRS website, uh, where where you submit a short form disclosure, disclosing the bank account, uh, the range of um, bank deposit, the range of income, uh, and uh, uh, as much information uh, as possible. The IRS there is seeking to know whether there's foreign bank off officers that participated in, you know, in advising you on offshore accounts and whether there are other banks involved. So this short form disclosure document is, is uh, very much an IRS um, information gathering on, on, uh, to the taxpayer to a certain extent and then to relationships of the taxpayer. Uh, in the offshore world to another extent. Um, and, and, that's, uh, and after that, after your 45-day uh, letter or your initial disclosure letter goes in, then you've got 90 days to send in uh, your, your, all your tax returns, your penalty calculations, and what have you. Um, things do seem to be a bit backed up in the IRS, and so there's there's um, doesn't appear to be a big push to to meet the 90-day requirement because they realize that people are getting foreign bank accounts from from years that are long since passed and and uh, it's, might not be able to get their house in a row uh, within just 90 days. So uh, there's liberal extensions of the. Uh, 90-day period to get all your final work in. Richard, I think you're setting a record here in terms of the number of questions asked. 
in five <laughs> minutes, ten minutes here. <laughs> <laughs> um, will the uh, taxpayer's voluntary disclosure be subject to an IRS examination? Uh, yes, yes. It's it's well. Let me put it this way: it's it's not it's not the audit type of examination, um, but it's it's definitely looked at by um, people who know it who know what they're doing. All right. Um, this is a little bit longer, so uh, bear with me. But I want to I want to ask it in entirety. I have property report. Um, I properly reported all my taxable income, but I only recently learned that I should have been filing FDARs in prior years to report my personal form bank account, or to report the fact that I have signature authority over bank accounts owned by my employer. May I come forward under this new program to correct this? Um, you know, uh, let me say this. I uh, I'd like to see it. I'd like to see that in writing and answer it slower because it's because it's a long question, but it sounded to me like uh, if you have the person who has no financial interest in there, um, and uh, I, I I would I'd have to get into those frequently asked questions for you, but it, it sounded to me from from what you just said that um, that taxpayer may may not need one of these programs. Um, I'd really have to have to you know take a little longer look at it, but it sounded to me like the taxpayer was describing uh, no 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 unreported taxable income, and 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 no interest uh, no financial interest in the in the bank accounts. So uh, I don't know. I really don't know if they if they need this disclosure program. All right, here's another one. Uh, does the Streamline program replace the offshore program? No. No, they're two separate programs. Uh, I'm just asking the short ones. Now, do, uh, do you need clearance for a Streamline program? No. But the clearance that one needs, as I said, as I really tried to make a point of, the clearance that one needs is to have a, a very clear understanding and be able to explain their non-willfulness because the, the people who are entering the Streamline program need to understand that these things, um, what the, the, way the, the, um, the way the program's instructions read, the, the instructions say, there's there's not going to be an automatic audit because you're in the streamline program, but if um, what what uh, if what they're disclosing looks awfully funny or there's uh, you know uh, it would come under audit um, uh, regardless of the streamline program, uh, the streamline program can be subject to an audit. Here's one from Michael. How soon after filing the delinquent FDAR should you request to be in the streamlined program? Uh, I, I, you know, I have to have facts. I really, I mean, in other words, um, uh, um, I, I think, I, I think if you if you if you belong in the streamlined program, um, your I mean, I'm, I'm just, I'm just kind of um, talking off the top of my head. But I think if you truly belong in the streamlined program, you've only got three years tax returns to do. Uh, I would get everything together and get my act together and submit it all at the same time, and be submitting the F bars, uh, submitting them right when you're submitting everything else. But you can't file the FBARs ahead of time. I mean, and if you know if you belong in the streamlined program, you, you're going to be okay with that. Here's one from Barb. I have several clients who have signatory on accounts which belong to the corporation and no personal accounts. Uh, how do the how do we access, uh, assess penalties if these clients fail to, to file the FBAR? Well, well, what, uh, what I mean. 
I, I, I'd really like, I'd need to know a lot more about um, the, the corporations, you know, I mean, and who, who, who owns the corporations? Are they, are they U.S. owned companies? I mean, are, um, I, I, that, it's, that, that's kind of not enough facts, I think, um, for me to really comment on it. All right. I'm sorry if I'm not getting the right uh, the top question. Um, does a 5% penalty apply to FR accounts that you only have signature authority over? Well, if you only have signature authority over them, you you may not be have any any penalty. I mean, if you have no interest in these things, you only have signatory over them. I mean, like for example, there's if you go on the frequently asked questions, um, there's there's a questions right on there where they say um, if a child was put on. Uh, as a signatory only as part of estate planning and that, those kind of things. Um, uh, so, so it's possible with signatory power only that um, you really just need to go file the FBARs and not really get into any one of these amnesty programs. Again, I, I just would have, I'd, I'd like to have a lot more facts to be definitive about that. All right, this one's from Melanie. Should a resident outside the U.S. enter the Streamline program to report an inheritance from a foreign person on Form 3520 for a prior year? Well, well, you're talking about two different, two different issues there. Um, um, if, if, if the, I mean, the, if, if the, if it's a now it, this is a U. This is a U.S. taxpayer, not who's not resident in the U.S. I'm trying to really. Yeah, I you know unfortunately I don't know. Yeah, see, I'm not I'm not sure if they're talking about U.S. taxpayer or a foreign taxpayer. That uh, it's it's not clear enough for me to really try and. Um, you know, try to answer. And, and, the, and Melanie said yes, a U.S. taxpayer. Okay, so read it to me again now. Oh, jeez, Richard, I'm so sorry. I deleted the yeah. question. I'm trying to no. stay organized. All right, no, I'm, sorry. All right. Yeah. I'm doing my best here. It's, it's, okay. uh, it's extensive. Um, right. Many countries require foreigners to hold real estate through a trust vehicle. Does a grantor or beneficiary this type of real estate only? Does a grantor or beneficiary of this type of real estate only trust re require reporting? Sorry, the language is funny. Well, you know, again, we get into we get into some little wider aspects of the law. I mean, typically, if someone is the grantor and the beneficiary of a trust, um, the trust is treated as if it doesn't even exist for tax purposes, um, and the and the grantor is is taxable. So, so um, uh, again, uh, uh, I mean, I would, uh, I would think if you're, if you've got a grantor trust that owns a foreign asset, uh, you're going to have to be, you're going to have to be reporting on that. But, uh, but it's still, it's, you know, to be answering questions like this um, with, with kind of a snippet of facts <laughs> it can be very misleading it really can be sure and and actually with that Richard we have you know just a minute left on the clock for the yeah. uh, for the course I, can, and you have so many questions and and um, and you put your contact information up but maybe you can right. just share with me what what the expectation is for people who have questions that weren't answered how you maybe you could even share how you generally work with the CPA community to help Either answer short, shorter questions or, or, or bigger issues. Yeah, just no. They can just you can just send an email to um, r Lehman mm -hmm. at lehmantaxlaw dot com, and I'll be I'll try to respond to those. Oh boy, Richard. Well, <laughs> you got to be careful. <laughs> you have to tell me how many there are. They could take a little time <laughs> off this weekend, maybe too. Um, <laughs> all right, so. There, there are more questions than any human or team of humans could, could I think, respond to in an hour and a half. Or maybe not. Maybe a team of humans can do it um, in an hour and a half period of time. Um, I just want to say this. How about it for Richard Lehman? Put in your 
comments. We're going to look for your evals. Richard, you, you uh, did a fantastic job today. Um, you took on a very challenging task. You told me um, that this was going to be a topic that everyone needed to know about, and uh, I, it's just been fascinating for me to, to see uh, the questions that have come in and the way you've dealt with it. And, and the comments are just awesome. Fantastic. Thanks again, Richard. Great information. Thank you. Very informative. Fantastic webinar. All right, well, thank, shout out thank, to you. thank all of you. Thank all of you for listening. <laughs> you got some fans here. Holy cow, you got a lot, Richard. So um, thank you so much, everybody, um, as well, for participating, right? It wouldn't happen without you. And uh, uh, our entire site depends on, on our presenters and our audience. And so we're just extremely grateful uh, for, for moments where, you know, everything just, just um, where, where questions are answered and, and, and uh, information is just being uh, disseminated. So it's, it's been a pleasure. I just want to let everyone know that your evaluations uh, are a requirement for us in order to, for us to issue CPE. The CPE is free. You're going to get that. You'll get it by the end of the day. But we made the evaluations a requirement because we really want to know what you think. Uh, we didn't have to do that. We did it because we want to see your numeric responses. We want to see your, your comments and your testimonials. And that allows us to continuously provide you with the best content that we can to make any adjustments. Uh, that, that you think are necessary. Um, so we're all yours. Please share that with us. And um, I will also pass on to Richard the questions that were not uh, answered. But just keep in mind, it's almost it's, it's, it's very difficult to sort through all of them. So uh, you have the contact information. Uh, the other thing that you're going to really appreciate is that we did record today's presentation. And of course, we're going to upload that to our site. I could certainly uh, anticipate the number of you that are going to share that, go back and watch it again, brush up. Um, but that's free for you as well, as uh, are the PowerPoint slides, which are made available and up on our site. And the other thing that I think you'll really like is the proctor letter. And we uh, invested quite a bit to make that incredibly simple, so that you can just enter in the names and email addresses of everyone who participated with you. And then CPE will instantly be issued. You don't even need us. It's automatic. So you verify that your colleague was there, and that's good enough for us. So we will issue the credit that way. Um, we have uh, just one class tomorrow, which is uh, about one-fourth of what we normally do. It's a class on keys to a successful firm management. And then uh, next week, we have a very full week. We're obviously aware of your tax reporting deadlines, with the exception of those and other holidays. We're going to go on as strong as we can until the middle of January with uh, many tax classes, many classes. Uh, covering just a very wide variety, anything from marketing to international taxation. So, so much stuff going on. Um, I love seeing all these comments. I'm glad you enjoyed the class. Thanks for sticking around a couple minutes after the hour. And um, everyone have a, I hope everyone has a wonderful uh, rest of your day. And uh, someone asked where the evaluation is. Just log into your account um, using your password. And, and you'll see this class is now a past registered class, of course. And there's a link to the eval. And we're also going to send a post-webinar email.